of California San Diego, as well as a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he teaches in the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. He holds a PhD in International Economics from Stanford University and a BA in European History from Brown University, but I also noticed that you spent some time at the University College of London. Yes. Yeah, exactly. uh, he has history. Had a, history. In history. Uh, he has had a, a very distinguished career as a diplomat, policy advisor, corporate consultant, university professor, as well as an author. He has been engaged with U.S. foreign policy, particularly for Latin America, for uh, four decades. He uh, served uh, in different uh, positions in the White House, Department of State, Department of Treasury, as well as numerous Washington-based public policy institutes, the Peace Corps in Chile, and academia. Um, he was also a public scholar, uh, policy scholar of the Latin American program at the Wilson Center, and is currently the book review editor for the Western Hemisphere section of Foreign Affairs. He is the author or co-author of, of numerous books, I'm just going to uh, focus on three, which uh, deal with Cuba. The latest one being, uh, actually the latest one is Tourism Cuba, no? uh, 2016, which we presented here, and uh, LARC was one of the co-sponsors of that project. Uh, as well as the, the other book, uh, Open for Business, Building the New Cuban Economy, published in 2016. And in 2011, he uh, released Reaching Out, Cuba's New Economy and the International Response. His articles and book reviews have appeared in numerous academic journals, including Foreign Affairs, America's Quarter, Orderly, and Latin American Politics and Society. And in addition to that, he's published uh, numerous opinion pieces in leading newspapers in the US and internationally, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Angeles Times and the Financial Times. Very happy that uh, he chose to uh, deal with this topic uh, of Cuba's forgotten eastern provinces, particularly because my own father's family is from Oriente, and I think uh, Oriente doesn't get enough um, attention, particularly vis a vis Havana, so I'm sure he's going to talk a little bit about that. So please help me welcome the Thank you very much, Corti. Actually, this paper should, is dedicated to you. Okay. <laughs> because you were really part of the inspiration, because in our various conversations we talked about you know, your, your homeland. And uh, you know, if you look at the literature on Cuba, it's really heavily, really about Havana. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Of course, Havana is, is like talking about Paris if you're talking about France, or uh, Buenos Aires if you're talking about Argentina. The power, culture, money, it's all concentrated in Havana. But, and it's also not that easy to get out to the Oriente these days. You know, the roads are in bad repair. Thanks to uh, our current administration, it's harder to fly there or go there to cruise ships. Um, so it is rather somewhat remote. Plus, it's not easy to do academic research there. Uh, as, as an American, it's very few, almost no Americans really have really gone out there to try to do anything that, rather than anecdotal stuff. Uh, I was able, actually, to get myself an unnamed research assistant, who, uh, Cuban, who uh, went to the various universities uh, in Holguin and uh, in Santiago, and found master's theses written by Cubans uh, in those university archives. So the material, formally speaking, is publicly available, but actually very hard to access. And so if you read the paper uh, that uh, was published by Brookings, uh, just in June, that this is based on, this talk is based on, that a lot of footnotes there, which uh, cite uh, some of these uh, deeply uh, encoded uh, master's theses. Is it available as a PDF online? This is, yes, the paper itself. Is, is free download. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I thought, uh, also I, I, got, I, I had said what I had to say about Central Cuba in the, any number of studies, and so I thought it would be interesting to try to do something a little different. And so hence, uh, I got out into the eastern provinces, uh, took a couple of trips out there myself. Uh, I was lucky enough with my wife, Diane, uh, back in the days of um, partial normalization with Cuba, I got myself a job on a cruise ship when it going around the island and then stopped in Santiago. <laughs> So that got me to San Diego a few additional times. Anyway, so Cuba's forgotten eastern provinces. What we're talking about here are the, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, the five eastern provinces. Uh, used to be known as El Oriente, Oriente, right? Do we have people here from Oriente, actually? Anybody? Nobody. My parents. Yes, okay. 
for whereabouts? From Santiago. Oh, right. So there we go. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then in uh, administrative reform in, I think, 1976, it was broken up into five of the 15 provinces. So it's, it's about roughly one third of Cuba, both in terms of population and uh, area. Uh, it has a brilliant history, right? Brilliant <laughs> history. Uh, of course, this is where the independent struggles were uh, largely based. Uh, this is where Teddy Roosevelt charged up San Juan Hill, and uh, based upon the heroics of that event, it really were quite spectacular. It becomes president of the United States, nothing else, nothing less. Uh, the, the Batista insurrection, uh, significantly based there, of course, the Castro brothers themselves uh, living uh, in, um, in that area. The famous, Castro's famous speech on January 1st, 1959, given from the balcony of the city hall in Santiago. Um, in terms of economics, you have uh, uh, Bacardi Rum was based there, although their headquarters had, had moved to Havana. Uh, people in, who are interested in uh, Cuban culture, a lot of what we think of as Cuban culture is actually from the Oriente, particularly if we're talking about uh, an Afro-Cuban influence. Uh, in terms of racial distinctions, uh, based upon self-identification, uh, in Havana, something like 40% of Cubans identify themselves as either black or mulatto, whereas about 60% uh, so identify themselves uh, in the Oriente and Santiago. Uh, Desi Arnaz is from the, the, the area. Of course, he was a Congo player, right? Um, Vista Alegre, and I'm about to show you a picture. Here we have it. Is this your street, possibly, nearby? Nearby? Vista Alegre, um, this is a photo that I took, so this, this is contemporary. And uh, it was and remains <coughs> a very nice suburban area, um, nicely planned when it was constructed in the first half of the 20th century, uh, not unlike Vedado or Miramar in uh, Havana. I think a little nicer in some ways. It's up on the hill. It's really quite nice. Um, the, who knows where this is? It's an island, <laughs> isn't it? Is it that island it's in the bay? Close. It's not an island, but close. It's, it's on the seashore. Oh, right. It's the old. Uh, um, I don't think it's an island, actually. Maybe a, it's a, uh, it's a promontory. Um, I, I put this little uh, effect on it because there's a. A, an international film festival there each year. That was oh, a big hit. That's a big hit. Yes. <laughs> so it, it was a nice fishing village. Now it's a, a cultural center uh, in Holguin province. Uh, but this is the more typical uh, life in uh, El Oriente. Uh, you know, people have homes, obviously, but it's, it's, it's really quite modest, rather poor. Traveling around the countryside in Oriente, uh, I feel like I'm maybe in Central America. I mean, uh, it's a long way away from what we think of as a middle class. Event. So it gives you a sense of a development backward. And that's what made me think there's got to be a, just in my travels around thinking, gee, you know, I feel like I'm in uh, El Salvador or, or Honduras. So what happened here? Uh, this was supposed to be. Uh, egalitarian Cuba, and back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a big thrust by the government to overcome you know, the poverty that had been there, uh, introducing schools, of course, health care, uh, new industries were built with subsidized Soviet money, uh, you still had sugar cane, uh, so the region was uh, improved relative to the rest, relative to Havana, uh, but then it seems to have slipped back. And so I asked myself, well, this is a story. What is the story? What happened here? And that's really the, the question that this paper tries to answer. Uh, the social indicators are actually still pretty good. The <coughs> Cuban government figures, it's all that we have. Uh, but if you're talking about longevity, for example, infant mortality, uh, basic social indicators, by and large, the, the five provinces uh, of, of the East are OK. Roughly equal to the national average, just Guantanamo, maybe, which is the poorest, maybe a little less. But on the whole, it seems that the social gains defined as uh, the, you know, uh, the, the basic social indicators have been uh, maintained. 
Now, it may be there's a lag in these numbers, but certainly if you visit the schools or the hospitals, the clinics, uh, they're not what they were. Is it clear decay? No question about it. And you would think eventually that decay uh, will be shown in the, in the results, in the indicators. But at least according to government figures, not yet. Is it possible they're being cooked? Uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, so then you, uh, with, with Cuban government numbers, that's always a possibility. Uh, some of them are more or less verified by international agencies, the United Nations, uh, WHO, for example, in this case. Uh, you have UNDP is also there. Uh, but, you know, it, it's hard to, any government, it's, it's hard to you know, really do uh, an alternative survey at, 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 at the quantitative level. So, yeah, uh, it is possible that there are, you know, at some point in time, I'm sure there will, there will be revisions to official government numbers. Uh, uh, in terms of the macro numbers, which we'll look at here, uh, so here you see GDP growth. This is for the country as a whole. So the blue line, GDP growth, very disappointing, 2%, 1% you know, over the last decade. Uh, these are official government numbers. Uh, and if you walk around Cuba, you wonder if those numbers even are correct. Then uh, if you look at exports, I mean, they've essentially, which is the, uh, the orange line, uh, exports, commodity exports, have essentially collapsed. As you see, the island is really producing almost nothing that can be sold internationally. It's really a, a sad story. Uh, uh, and imports have therefore had to decline as well. Now, the difference between the exports and the imports is service exports, that is to say, tourism, remittances, which allow for imports to exceed commodity exports. But still, imports are down. So if you travel around the island, and this is true in Nevada, but also in the eastern provinces, uh, there are shortages of, of whatever. Uh, yeah. And that's a result of the, the international uh, decline. <coughs> okay. Other factors explaining why the situation in Oriente uh, has reversed, why the early gains in the, the early decades of the revolution have not held. Well, there were some industries built uh, with, linked to, to Comic-Con, Soviet system, Soviet <coughs> subsidies, when parts, uh, et cetera, were no longer available uh, and at a heavily subsidized level, a lot of those factories shut down, unemployment. And then at the same time, roughly, you had uh, a collapse of the sugar industry in Cuba, something like two-thirds of the refineries shut down gradually over time, particularly in the uh, early noughts. Uh, and so you can go to some small towns and you think you're like in, this, in, in Detroit. I mean, really, uh, towns that are just, you know, their basic uh, source of uh, employment and income uh, around the sugar ref refineries uh, have, have never uh, recovered. Actually, I was at the Havana Biennale uh, just in last April, right? Seems so long ago. Uh, and uh, there was a, a very touching film that had been made, and this, this, is, this was shown in the Museum of Bellas Artes as part of the overall arts fair. A film's done of uh, sugar mill workers and their communities that had been taken uh, about 10, 15 years ago, in which, uh, again, this could have been Detroit. It, uh, when you go into an area where there's been industrial collapse and with a psychological uh, trauma, that is for those who are so affected. And you know, the government tries to sugarcoat it. Oh, you know, yes, this is difficult, but we'll come back and there will be new investments, but that just hasn't happened <coughs> in the Cuban case. So you just find very depressed, uh, abandoned uh, towns. So both the agricultural and in the uh, industrial sector uh, decline. Now, there are new engines of growth on the island, and uh, three that are particularly important. But none of them, unfortunately, are particularly <coughs> beneficial to the eastern provinces. So you have uh, international tourism, uh, but heavily based in the Havana, Matanzas area. Now, uh, there is a lot of, have any of you been to Holguin? Okay, in the last year, two or three no, years? Not, no, no, not that recent. Okay, anyway, uh, there are a lot of beautiful beaches and keys that are along there, and the government does see that as a future tourism growth pole, and not, 
quite a few hotels are being built there. So, uh, but by and large, uh, you go to San Diego, for example, and, and elsewhere, and you just don't see all that many tourists. So the tourism heavily concentrated uh, in the Havana uh, and the Tanzas areas. Similarly with remittances. So remittances go to uh, you know, largely the middle class families that have emigrated, and that's again largely from Havana. What you, and, the, and the surrounding areas are not entirely. Uh, but uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, there is internal migration in Cuba from the eastern area. They, they then go to maybe Santa Clara, then Havana, and some of them stay and then continue onwards uh, to go overseas. Anyway, but so remittances, although we don't have, I haven't seen any remittances by provinces, uh, I still think it's safe to bet that they're concentrated in the Havana area. And then the whole uh, rise of the private sector, it's been about um, 10 years now, you've got to go for the private sector. Uh, current government uh, is ambivalent, uh, so it, the growth rates have slowed, and then of course the reduction in American tourists has also hurt. Uh, but still, the numbers do show that the growth in the private sector, again, has been largely uh, not in the east, but in the center and in the west. So the three engines of growth, tourism remittances and small business, uh, have not benefited uh, to the same degree in the eastern provinces as they have Havana and the surrounding areas. This shows uh, tourism uh, and the number of rooms. And you can see uh, how heavily concentrated they are uh, in Havana and Varadero, uh, and much less so in the eastern provinces. You have a little bit in San Diego and Holguin, and then almost nothing in the other three provinces of Panama, Las Tunas, and Guantanamo. Uh, you do have some growth in Casas Pantipas uh, in Santiago. Uh, in fact, there are, uh, and in Holguin, there are more, uh, it, it to be in Santiago, there are more rooms in private homes than there are in hotels. Uh, this is also true, by the way, in, in Trinidad, interestingly enough, uh, where for various reasons uh, the government hasn't been able to put in or hasn't wanted to put in as many hotel rooms. So it's been an opportunity for Cuban families to open their homes uh, to visitors and makes it what for Cubans can be a significant amount of money. Why, is there extra, why are there extra bedrooms in many Cuban homes? You demographers here, why is this? No birth. Yes, yeah. people have fewer children. Also, the people originally own the homes that have left the country. Have left the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, that, yes. Uh, if they entirely left the country, of course, they no longer have the home. Mm -hmm. But um, people who then occupy the homes uh, have fewer kids. And these would be that, presumably are earlier homes built before. Yes. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, these would almost all be, as they refer to it, as capitalist era <laughs> before 1959. Uh, Solo Republica, they call it. Yeah, meaning, also, meaning also better construction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so people have extra bedrooms because they have fewer kids. Uh, uh, and uh, they rent them out, and if, they, if you can rent them out at $20, $30 a night, considering the average uh, salary is only about Forty dollars a month. If you can rent a room out, you know, say fifteen days uh, out of the month, do the numbers, and it's a very significant increment to your family income. So, you, mm -hmm. so you do see some of that happening, uh, particularly in Santiago, uh, but much more so again in the Havana area. So tourism, uh, although some injection of money into the east, not nearly as much as it is for the center in the West. Now, here's a real shocker. <coughs> this is not about uh, an external factor. This is not about remittances, tourism. This is about the Cuban government. And I was, these are official numbers, and I was really amazed to see this. That, uh, and this is true, this is, these numbers are 2017, but they're, all, they're generally true for several, you know, as a trend. So total investment, uh, this is in uh, Cuban pesos. What, 8 billion pesos or whatever for, for the whole island. And you can see of the 8,000 here, over half is going just to about the one pro the, the, the city, the province of the land. Over half. Now, how could that be? Why would that be? It tells you about the political power structure. In earlier years, 
and I spoke to some people who had actually been involved in the decision making processes in the 60s and 70s. The people who were in charge of planning national investment made a big effort to move that money out, to have it spread around the island in a more or less equitable way. But over time, the forces of history reassert themselves. Or you could say the power structure. Also, they, they viewed Havana as the heart of darkness. They had. Capital is darkness. They had, initially. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right, initially. Uh, the idea at the time of the revolution initially was to move things out. But those attitudes faded over time. And the, the Communist Party, of course, who drives all of this, they themselves were living in Havana, maybe in the homes of some of your families. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, the money stayed very significantly in Havana. You can see virtually none of it uh, going out to Gran Malas Tunas and Guantanamo, a little bit to the cities, actually, of Holguin and Santiago. So um, why is Havana looking somewhat better? Why is the infrastructure in Havana somewhat better than it is in the outlying eastern provinces? This tells you a lot of the story right here. So if you want to know why the roads are decaying, why uh, the quality of building, etc. The uh, utilities are decaying. This, this tells me uh, the story. But of course, in Cuba, it's all about public sector investment, and this is the story of public sector investment. So, as a result of all of this, in terms of the demography, uh, you have here uh, net migration. You have people moving into Havana. The population of Havana rising plus seven. Uh, this is per thousand inhabitants. So out of every thousand inhabitants, seven each year from uh, the rest of the island move to Havana. But the, the five eastern provinces, you have negatives, people leaving. Why do they leave? Because the opportunities are less. That's why people move, or the, job, or the wages are lower, of course. So people move. These numbers understate internal migration. Why do they understate internal migration? Because you're not supposed to leave the eastern part of the island and move to Havana without permission of various sorts, various permits. A lot of people don't have those permits, so but they move anyway. And so when they're asked, where do you live? Oh, I still live in, in Guantanamo, or I still live in uh, Santiago. <coughs> and that was the numbers would show that they're still living back there at <coughs> home. But in fact, they're living in Havana. I can ascertain that from people that I've met and spoke to in person. So uh, I think it's a, it's a general story. And you can see it in Havana. Havana, if any of you uh, remember the old days, Havana is a large, as to say, the complexions of people are a lot darker today than they would have been uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And the reason for that is this. People are moving from the more Afro-Cuban areas in the eastern provinces migrating to the better economic opportunities in Havana, and then literally changing the complexion of Havana. Uh, fertility rates, children per women. So in Havana, your average woman has what, just a little less than one and a half kids, uh, which is to say uh, people in Havana don't have that many kids. You can say, wow, this shows a, an advanced level of development. Uh, it's like Scandinavia or Tokyo, where also people choose not to have many children. Why don't people choose to have children? Well, everything from the availability of contraception and abortion, uh, choice, you could say. Uh, but also, if you ask Cubans, uh, life is hard. Uh, raising kids, even though social services are almost free, it's still expensive. And so there, people make the choice to have fewer kids. But on the, in the East, which is still more rural in part, people have more kids, so uh, significantly more kids. So even though you have the out-migration from the east to the center and the west, that's partly made up for the more rapid population growth. So those, the overall net population is probably more or less constant uh, in uh, the east. Now, in Havana, you have more people moving in, but what's happening next? What's, st what's stage two? Poof, they leave the island altogether. And this is particularly disconcerting for, I mean, I myself and I think for the Cuban economy, because the people who leave these days tend to be the better educated young people, as you say, human capital. Uh, 
Uh, if you talk to people who, who go to the better high schools or university departments, 80% uh, of their colleagues and peers are now off island. Uh, and so you have you know, certain, a movement from the east to the west and then you know, Nevada off island. That's the, the cycle. It seems that divorce rates are higher in Nevada. You can speculate as to why that might be. <laughs> With it, but uh, there's, there's more sort of instability in that regard. Huh. Okay. But the basic story here is, in terms of my paper, is that the depressed economic situation uh, is revealed by migration patterns. <coughs> hmm. uh, labor force participation. This is, these are, this is an interesting phenomenon, by the way. We see a little bit of this in the United States. So um, this means that of people of from like it's the age of 18 to 64 in the working years, what percent of those people actually work as defined by government numbers in the labor force. And so for Cuba as a whole, uh, you have a significant decline just from 2012 to 2017. 74% uh, of people are working in 2012, which is five years later, it's down to 63%. That's a big drop. That's, and we see that through, uh, throughout the island. So in Santiago, from 70 to 63, for example. Why, do you, why such a dr dramatic drop in labor force participation rate? Well, you could say maybe this is just a government statistical uh, curiosity. On the other hand, it could be, be if you walk around, say, downtown Santiago, what do you find? A lot, of, a lot of young people hanging out on the street corner. How come they're not working? Or are they working? But if they're officially Cuenta Propista, they would appear as working if they have the permit. But if they're doing it, um, you know, just informal, the informal sector, yeah. So what you see here is people moving into the, some people maybe just staying home. Hey, you're going to pay me 40 bucks a month? It's not worthwhile to go to the factory anymore. Forget it. I'm just going to stay home and maybe I'll make a little money, whatever, knitting, uh, making cookies, I'm trying to sell them hustling in any number of ways. The black market, of course, is huge throughout the island. People work in factories, they get paid very little, they're unhappy, uh, and they pilfer. And we know that the pilferage uh, is very high. And uh, people then, of course, resell a lot of those products, and that's the black market. And they make more money doing that than they would an official job, so hence the decline in labor force participation rates. I think that's very telling. We've seen a little bit of this in the United States, by the way. But not, not as dramatic as this. Is, is some of that maybe also due to the, I mean, there is an aging population more as time passes. They're getting older, right? So we understand the, the reason that you, the number, the percentage of retirees is growing. Well, if, uh, so these numbers would be, uh, I think, I think if I remember right, uh, up until age 64. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's the, the years when people are typically work, working age. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is true, of course, that there are more older people uh, in Cuba these days. And I like that. <laughs> people bemoan, oh my god, the population is getting old. I say, no, this is wonderful. These people are, they have better judgment, they're smarter, they're more attractive, even. <laughs> right? 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 We're not going to be bullied by these millennials. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. I don't think I count I always like to end up on, on an upbeat note. So, okay, there's been decline. Uh, life is tough, people are leaving the Oriente. But, looking to the future, one could, one could imagine, a, uh, a, what a, again, a reversal of fortune, but this time uh, moving forward and moving upward. Because the resources are there. This is not, uh, it might not be the richest area of the world in terms of natural resources, but it's not poor either. There are lots of uh, opportunities that can be built upon. So you have all sorts of tourism that could occur. And, got lots of beaches, caves, etc. So that whole sort of tourism uh, and uh, not expensive because the costs are low. Uh, urban culture, Santiago, Hogin, uh, lots to do, fun places. Uh, rural adventures, you've got mountains, you've got rivers. Uh, Agri-tourism, if you want to go visit, tourists could go visit uh, cigar factories, sugar plantations, etc. Uh, potentially health tourism at some point. So uh, international tourism, diversified international tourism, uh, definitely. And the Cuban government, by the way, understands all this. 
but then you need to invest. You need to have better roads, you need to have better communication, you need to have better everything uh, to really drive this forward. Uh, agriculture, you've got some good lands. Organics is something one could do. They have organics by requirement because they haven't been able to afford all the uh, chemicals that you know, are associated with modern agriculture. And in a way that enables them to leap uh, that whole process directly into organics. And you do have some of that, but you do a lot more. Uh, energy, you know, uh, sail around. It's interesting to sail around the island rather than just fly in because you get a sense, by the way, of why cities are located where they are. Why are they located where they are? Because of natural ports. That's why Santiago is where it is. That's why Havana <coughs> is where it is, etc. That's where the Spanish uh, ships landed. That's why the battle of the most important battle of the independence wars was Santiago in the harbor, where the U.S. naval ships um, uh, blockaded what remained of the Spanish Armada and said, "You guys better surrender or else." And I think they did actually sink a few ships just for the hell of it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, and when you travel around the island, you see how much wind there is blowing around the island. So yeah. Huge potential for uh, wind, uh, solar panels, of course, sunny, uh, biomass. Now, again, the Cuban government sort of recognizes all of this. You know, it would be genius to see this. But they're not able to do much about it. And they put out publications saying, yes, we're going to invest in solar. And then they put up, you know, 10 turbines and say, yeah, look at us. Or wind turbines, yeah, look at us. Uh, in fact, in, uh, in Kibara, you can see from where that photo is that 10 wind turbines in the background. 10. They need a hundred, they need a thousand. And that would require a whole different level of government energy and sense of urgency as well as uh, op serious openness to foreign uh, partnerships. There's nickel uh, with Canadian participation. The price of nickel is, is somewhat down these days, but uh, that's another source of growth. Light manufacturing, which you don't now see. If you talk to the Cubans about, oh, maybe, why don't you have like a Nike factory uh, or something of this sort, light manufacturing. <gasps> oh, we can't have our workers, our educated workers, doing manual labor. <gasps> oh my god, you know, like you could, actually. <laughs> and did they ever have any on, during the Soviet period? Or Soviet yeah, they did. Period? Yes, uh, it wasn't efficient enough to export. Well, well, maybe they maybe sold a little bit of it into the Eastern Bloc. But yeah, they did have some. Not, not very good quality, but yes, they did have some. Mm -hmm. Correct, so thank you for that. No, I was just wondering. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Um, so one of my uh, sort of innovative ideas is one day the base at Guantanamo, the U.S. naval base, which is just sort of sitting there and not being used very much anymore, it clearly is uh, ar archaic. Talk to anybody in the U.S. Navy, they readily admit that. Uh, at one point, it will be handed over to the Cubans. And what are they going to do with this nice base? I say, turn it into a free trade zone, in which they would have light manufacturing, which could be the product, just like you have in the Dominican Republic, for example. You would, you could, because of proximity, and now that we've decided, by the way, that we don't think it's such a great idea for U.S. supply chains to be so concentrated in China, oh. Let's move a little bit of that to uh, Guantanamo. Wouldn't have to be very much. You know, create 100,000 jobs, but it would make a big difference uh, to uh, the very depressed economy out there in Guantanamo. Uh, and then finally, uh, regional administrative autonomy. Cuba is super centralized, of course, from Havana. Partly this reflects the structure of the Communist Party itself. Uh, in the new constitution, uh, there's talk about greater regional administrative autonomy to say pushing decision making, pushing some resources downwards. Uh, we'll see if that happens. At some point, that may happen. Whether or not that will happen so long as the Communist Party uh, <coughs> is so strong and centralized, uh, I think we may be seeing that distant pull in the other direction. But at some point, you'll see more administrative decentralization. So this is the future. Looking forward, I think that these things will eventually happen, although exactly when it's hard to say, but I think you will eventually see recovery and growth in your home village. Okay, so with that, thank you very much. This is a, a seat in the to the... Who will have the political...